Ready to talk about Ultraman? Cause I sure am! In 1954, a monster made his way into the world. The King of the Monsters walked into the hearts of a country. The success of Gojira and cinemas ensured that the man who made it happen, Eiji Tsuburaya, would have a long career with Toho. Since its release, Tsuburaya worked on many kaiju films, but there was one project that he really wanted to do. Tsuburaya, a lover of the Twilight Zone and the Outer Limits, seeked to bring his effects to the small screen. Eventually, he split from Toho and created Tsuburaya Productions. Tsuburaya was finally able to create the show that he dreamed about, entitled it... Ultra Q. Little did he know that his series would lead to one of the most well-known and beloved heroes of all time. It's the year 1966, and the world received Ultraman. Naturally, everything starts with an intro. So how's this one? This beautiful rally sung by the Misuzu Children's Choir with additional vocals from Koro Stella to the silhouettes of different kaiju make this adorable intro really memorable. From these kaiju to the silver and red giant itself popping up, and then the transitioning colors behind it all, it kind of like ties everything together to make something really fantastic. This opening shows what the series is. Well, uh, we'll stick a pin in it. Ow! What? This light and fun song shows the amazing campy style of the early episodes of the show. Speaking of these episodes, why do I get into them already? Let's start with episode 1, Ultra Operation number 1. A jet can be seen streaking through the sky. This marvelous science flies as its pilot, a member of the secretive Triple SP, also known as the Science Patrol, because they're science boys. Shin Hayata is preparing to head back home. A light, mm, wait, no, two, both red and blue, appear in the sky. Suddenly, the ship crashes with the blue light. On the ground lies the body of Shin Hayata. However, he awakens. Hey, hey bro, I'm, I'm so, so sorry. sorry. I wasn't, I wasn't checking, checking my mirrors. mirrors. Let, Let me make, make it up to you. Here, here. here. Take, take this a giant vape pen. pen. It'll, It'll do, do one. one. Once. A giant alien looms over him. He introduces himself. He is a member of an intergalactic police force who is following a fugitive when he crashed. The being feels remorse and tells Hayata that he will revive him with his life. They will merge and defeat any kaiju that dares attack. A creature, known as Bemular, is cute, in a Pigmon sort of way. Oh, but just you wait. I'll get to Pigmon soon. Anyways, the Triple SP arrive searching through the wreckage for their friend. And when they think all hope is lost, they find him. Hayata's back! And now, merge with Ultraman. This, folks, is our titular Ultraman. And the suit is... not the best. Don't get me wrong, Ultraman's overall design is great. It's the kind of design that you can trust to bring your daughter back home by 10. This iteration of the suit is the awkward, messy, unsure of itself middle school phase of the design. It's really janky and rough around the edges. All of this is due to rush production, failed animatronics, and basically is their prototype suit. It does, however, both show the ambition of the designers and it lays the groundwork for a better beast suit in the future. In regards to Bemular, uh, Big Daddy G should give his lawyers a call because that beam attack, I'm pretty sure, pretty sure, is ripping off something. But I can't quite put my finger on it. Oh yeah, speaking of attacks, let me take a minute to talk about the fights in the show. A lot of the stunt choreography does appear to be some punching and rolling around. But when he throws the kaiju over his shoulder, that is in fact 
Judo, a grappling type of martial arts, utilizing Judo with some elements of Jiu-Jitsu can present this form of strength that goes into throwing massive giants as both Judo and Jiu-Jitsu always incorporate element of grappling and tossing your opponent to the ground. Keep in mind, this isn't what the actual martial art looks like to the fullest extent. Ultraman's fight choreography utilizes the basic technique. You know, a little bit of Tayo Toshi here, a bit of Haragoshi there, and bam! You got the Ultraman fight choreography. This episode is sure something. It sets up the series and introduces our heroes very well. It's rough in a couple places, but it's still a solid start to the show. Like most flowers, they start as a bud. And this bud is very promising. Speaking of our heroes, why don't we introduce them? First off, there's Hayata. He wields his wife's vibra- What? I mean, the beta capsule. In all actuality, he is more like your run-of-the-mill heroic do-gooder. You know, for the kiddies. His character does show a little more depth as an optimistic hero later on in the show that does dearly care for his teammates. Second up, there's the Triple S Peace Fearless Leader, Captain Muramatsu. He is the stoic leader of the group, but definitely shares a close bond with the rest of the team. He wishes to see the best out of the fellow members and is a well-respected man. Plus, he is the guy who played Tachiban in the original Rider. Wait, what? Next up is the team's communications liaison, Fuji. She is Goro. I'm kidding. Fuji starts out as a pretty one-note character, but later develops into an almost little sister of the group. She is kind and caring to the other members, and she definitely pulls her weight in the team. When talking about Fuji, it is good to mention one thing all writers can't make up their minds over, and that's for who she has romantic feelings for. As we will later see, the show makes it pretty obvious that Ide and Fuji are good friends, and then eventually they become more than friends. They become best friends. But then, they become more than best friends. They become, uh, I don't know. Super best friends? Because in almost every universe, she ends up with Hayata. Poor, poor Hide. Then, there's the team's quick shot, Arashi. Stubborn and abrasive, Arashi always uses his temper and expertise of weaponry to try and solve all of their problems. That works about as well as it sounds. But through his stumbles and mishaps, he overcomes them to become an excellent and stand-up member of the Triple SP. Then last, but certainly not least, there is the weapons developer and comedic genius Ide. He's my sugar daddy. Actually, in all, in all honesty, he steals the spotlight every time, and he is a delight to see on screen. I really like Ide to the point where I wish he was actually the main lead. He definitely has more personality that doesn't involve him relying on the fact that he has the main selling point of the show. Truly a standout character. However, there is a better way to sum up Ide. <laughs> Episode 2, Shoot the Invaders. We open the Triple SP's member Ide answering the phone. His eye is black and the other members of the team seem to be looking at him funny. After some light banter with Fuji, Ide looks at the camera. He asks, huh? How'd this happen? Well, I'll tell you if you keep it a secret from my friends. Wait, what the fuck? What? How can he see me? Does he know I exist? How is he doing this? Stop looking at me! Stop the rest of the episode will be presented as this. A story about what happened from Ide's perspective. Ide and his bunkmate Arashi are woken by an alarm. They both quickly get changed into their uniforms. Cap briefs the team saying that there is a strange signal coming from the sky before quickly disappearing. The team quickly figures out where the signal comes from, but not before they point out that Arashi is wearing his slippers. Ya goose. Insert funny Ide moment here! Arashi and a surprise Hoshino head out to the science center. However, they come across not only another weird signal, but also man frozen suspended animation. As Hoshino calls the Triple SP to inform them of their situation, Arashi is attacked by the Kaijin in this episode, Alien Baltan. A security meeting is held to try and figure out the situation. That night, a group of soldiers along with the Triple SP arrive back at the center. Ide gives Cap the rundown on the plan to shoot at the second apparition of the Baltan. As Ide walks through the compound, he runs across Baltan, who manages to confuse Ide by making more than one copy of himself. Baltan leads a terrified Ide to the roof, where a now controlled Arashi tells of Baltan's situation and plan. It is revealed that there are 2.1 billion Baltans on their ship, ready to take over the Earth. Holy crap, that's a lot of Baltans! With this, Baltan Girl's giant starts its attack. During this attack, Hayata accidentally drops the beta capsule off of the roof, with it landing on the windowsill. He has no option but to jump for it. There he goes. That ballsy, ballsy man. Having successfully transformed into Ultraman, a chase in the air begins, and ends as Ultraman sets Baltan ablaze. Ultraman tosses the foe into the mothership, blowing it up. We then transition back to Ide. As the team all talk about what happened, Ide lets it slip that he had the thought that Hayata might have been Ultraman. Oh gee, I don't know where you came up with that one. Oh! And what about what happened to Ide's eye? Well, he fell off his bed. <sighs> of course he did. Don't change, Ide. 
Okay, so episode two is by far the very best of the first eight episodes of the story. Not only does it have a memorable villain, but also gives us a lot of great humor from Ide. This is just the start of how great Ide would be as a character. Baltan is, of course, one of the most iconic kaiju designs from Ultra Man. He has a really solid design with interesting crustacean-like features, but also otherworldly. His power set is incredibly trippy and really lets Tsuburaya flex their VFX chops for the world to see. So it's no wonder to see why it's one of Guillermo del Toro's favorite Ultra Kaiju. Yeah. Ultraman has a really wide reach for an audience outside of Japan. This episode would be a great sign of things to come. Episode 4. Five seconds before the explosion. Fuji, Hoshino, and his friend go on a vacation. Meanwhile, the Triple SP search for four missing nukes. Three of them have been recovered, but unfortunately one of them is currently trapped on the Kaijin for the week. Named Ragon. Ragon attacks Hoshino's friend, and then Ultraman puts a stop to that. He fights while trying not to hit the nuke, resulting in a defeated Ragon and the nuke delivered safely. This is the start of what I like to call the boring cluster. The boring cluster first episodes four through six, and it's literally the best way to fall asleep. They are beat for beat the same episode structurally. It's like Mad Libs where they fill in the blanks. Any eagle-eyed viewer will notice that I've been skipping over a couple episodes. This is because Ultraman 66 does not really have an overarching plot. I'm gonna use the E word here. It's episodic, which almost turned me off to the show early on. But that's okay. Sometimes you gotta give a flower but a little extra water so you grow. We're gonna get some really good episodes later on, folks, let me tell ya. For example, episode 7, The Blue Stone of Baraji. A giant meteor crashes somewhere in the Middle East. The Turkish and Indian branches of the Triple SP have sent research parties that have all mysteriously disappeared. A representative from the headquarter branch, that being the French branch, arrives in Japan to explain the situation and ask for help. Excited and honored that they were chosen to figure it out, all of the Triple SP, except for Fuji, move out. As they approach the crash point, a magnetic wall of light screws with their equipment and the team goes down. Ide is hurt, but not too badly. The team looks around for the source of the interference when they eventually find the meteorite. A bunch of sand starts kicking up and is slowly coming towards Towards the meteor. Ide sees this and runs towards the team. He warns them about a monster in the sand approaching. As they run back to the jet VTOL, they find it half buried in a hole. The monster peers out of the sand, and after shooting off a round at it, Arashi's spider shot is taken by the field. Continuing on, they find what they believe to be an ancient ghost city. They soon find the inhabitants and attempt to communicate. Unfortunately, they cannot figure it out. Suddenly, a woman appears, Her Royal Majesty Shartam. Shartam explains that there are a forgotten people, descended straight from the story of Noah. Wait, Noah? He ain't supposed to be here to Ultraman Nexus. This is Ultraman Noah. He is the figure who helped the Barati people survive the harsh life in the desert. This Noah is the same who would appear later in Ultraman Nexus. Noah is claimed to be the Barati's god, bestowing upon them a blue stone that keeps them safe and alive. Suddenly, the sand creature, Antlar, destroys their temple. In order to stop the rampage of this terrible creature, Hayata transforms into Ultraman. However, this isn't enough. It is up to the queen to give the gift of the stone to the Triple SP, who throws it at the kaiju, causing its defeat. Now that it is defeated, the Barati people must move on, leaving their city for the desert to consume. The Triple SP are picked up by a new jet VTOL, saying farewell to the Barati forever. Okay, this episode is fantastic. It's a great change of pace from the boring cluster of episodes after the Baltan episode. We get to see that the Triple SP is a worldwide organization. The set for the episode is great. I love the sprawling desert and the hidden village. It felt like a great self-contained adventure with actual stakes and the same formula as set before. It kept me invested and it kept me on the edge of my seat as to what would happen next. This episode really made me fall in love with the show. Plus, it was cool to see a statue of Ultraman Noah, even if he wouldn't be explored until Nexus. Episode 8, The Monster Anarchy Zone. Two years after volcanic eruption left the island of Tatarajima deserted, an observation station was opened and a four-man advance party was sent. After a week, there was no word from the team, so the Triple SP were requested to check out the situation. As the Triple SP make their way over to the island, they come across two kaiju fighting. Red King and Chandora fight to the death, with Red King coming out as the victor. As the VTOL flies over, Arashi suggests shooting at Red King to possibly defeat it. Cap tells Arashi that they are there in order to find the team, and that if they aggravate the kaiju that the team could be put at risk. The team lands and starts their research. They come across the research center, now destroyed and abandoned. Hayata and Arashi are hunted by another kaiju named Megular. While distracting it, Hayata is knocked off of a cliff and is knocked unconscious. Meanwhile, Fuji, Cap, and Ide are following a red little monster. They tag it with a tracking balloon as it leads them to a man, hurt on a cliff. This little guy's name is Pigmon. He is a recycled Garamon suit from the previous Ultra series, Ultra Q. The one difference is that Pigmon is not a robot and isn't an alien sent to destroy the planet. Uh, unless... Nah. It is revealed that only one of the members of the team had survived. Even worse than that, it looks like Red King found them. 
As the kaiju gets closer, Pigmon, the little hero, decides to distract the beast long enough for Hayata to awaken and transform into Ultraman. After the battle, the team buries those who passed, remembering that nature isn't always as beautiful as the sunset they witness. To Sasaki, Kawada, Fujita, and Pigmon, farewell. The obvious standout kaijin and character in this episode is Pigmon. His design is ugly, but that works in its favor thanks to the suit actor's mannerism, making it emanate energies of a cute puppy, which of course makes it adorable. I mentioned before that Bemular was Pigmon cute. What does this mean? It's so ugly that it's cute. There really isn't a way to explain it. It's one of those things you gotta see for yourself. Also, his death was actually emotionally gripping. As oddly corny as that sounds, I believe it stems from how we as humans hate to see animals get hurt or killed on screen. With the creature's mannerisms being that of an innocent puppy, seeing it get crushed under rocks is just really sad to see. In those short four or five minutes, they find a way to make you attach to Pigmon. With that stated, this episode made me hate Red King with a fiery burning passion. How dare he kill the boy, the piece of sh isn't even red, piece of fucking shit. My hands around his fat fucking neck and watch the lights leave his fucking beady little Fucking guys, a little piece of fucking <laughs> Episode 10, The Mysterious Dinosaur Base. We open in a dark, mysterious mansion. A caged crow cries as many animals, from rabbits to interior crocodile alligators, are shown. A man talks to himself as he tries to feed one of the many animals that he owns. The scientist mentions something named Jurass, as outside roars can be heard over the lake. Kitayama Lake is a peaceful lake deep in the heart of the mountains, a secluded spot that none would normally visit. Despite this, a group of people can be seen. Fishing. They quickly catch some fish. However, they're abnormal. The Triple SP are called to check out these fish and what has happened in the lake to cause their mutations. The Triple SP arrive both their jet VTOL and the submarine, and they drop the sub into the lake to check things out, as Cap promises them a special vacation. Oh boy, gee thanks mister! Ide, Hayata, and Arashi finish up the search and spend some time laying around their hotel. Meanwhile, a reporter named Kubo and photographer Hayashi from the magazine The Young Graph are heading to the home of Professor Nakamura, who is given the title The Monster Professor. Ooh. It is pretty fitting that their car is modeled after a kaiju as well. These two arrive at the professor's house as news broke that there is a dinosaur in Loch Ness, a strange parallel to the dinosaur-like creature that lives in Lake Kitayama. The professor explains what kind of dinosaur it may be and recounts a past exploration to the loch that resulted in the death of one of his friends. That night, Ide and the girl meet up and look over the lake, when suddenly, a creature's roar can be heard from a now bubbling lake. The two start exploring the area when they stumble across the professor's cave. They are soon caught and trapped, with Ide's communicator being destroyed in the process. The Triple SP soon confronts the monster Juras, using the spider shot. However, it doesn't seem to do much to the recycled Godzilla. Ide manages to fix his communicator and notify the team of their situation. As Juras attacks the mansion, Ide and Kubo are freed right in the nick of time. Hayata now turns into Ultraman, who brutally defeats the kaiju, but not before the professor is killed by his own work. As he lies there crying out the name of his obsession, the man dies. In this episode, the monster Juras is a reuse of a Godzilla suit. But wait, there's more! Haro Nakajima, the suit actor for The King of the Monsters, was called up to take the suit out for another go. This episode felt like a classic Showa Godzilla film, and that isn't because there was a recycled Godzilla suit. It felt like the film Terror Mecha Godzilla with its sense of despair and campiness. Actually, many of the episodes feel like Showa Japanese monster movies. They exhibit the same quality and effects and really give the feel of a self-contained film. That may have to do with a certain someone. As you may see, Ultraman basically set the groundwork for what tokusatsu is today, with its then cutting edge visual effects. Episode 11, The Rascal from Outer Space. We open in a field. A bunch of kids are eating and playing as they play leapfrog. Hoshino looks up to the sky to see a mysterious object crash into the field. After collecting the object, the kids find out about its strange shape-shifting powers. Maybe it can shape-shift into a 401k? What the hell knows? Hoshino and the group of kids, or as I like to call them, the Kid Cult, wish for the orb to become a cake. After an impressive shot of the cake being made, the kids start their evil cult dance. Oh boy. As they continue to test its abilities, they find that when they stop thinking about the object, that it reverts into its ball form. Hoshino hands it over to the Triple SP who then hands the rock over to the science center. It is then that Professor Yamamoto analyzes it and finds that it was made out of a compound not found on Earth. He recites this information during a press conference, adding that the rock is actually an organic compound. The science team let members of the press try out this living stone, which results in one reporter breathing life into it, shaping it to be his perfect wife. Is that... is that legal? The science team explains that the living stone is able to become what one wishes through the use of telepathy. While the team explains the dangers, a man plants a bug under his table. Huh, I wonder what that's for. 
Well, after everyone leaves the building, the man turns on a radio and starts talking to the rock, making it into a liquid to escape his container, then into a rocket in order for him to steal it. The man, now back at his hotel room, ponders to himself on what he should use the rock for. Food? Money? Nah, he's gonna use it to pull a prank. He asks the rock to turn into a human-sized monster called Gyango, and hilarity ensues. The man, out of either greed or pure incompetence, asks the rock to grow into a much larger version of Gyango, which proceeds to crush the man and the hotel. Mmm, delicious. The Triple SP launch, arriving at the remains of the hotel to find the man unconscious. Hayata comes to the conclusion that as long as the man is knocked out, that the stone will stay as Gyango. As the monster goes on a rampage, the defense force is called to hold it back. As the creature plays a little game of hide-and-go-seek, it shoots its shot and lands a three-pointer, crashing the jet VTOL into the water below. Hayata is forced to use the beta capsule underwater. Darn, that was a collector's piece. Hayata, now Ultraman, emerges from the water. As he flies to the sky, the creature sits there and giggles, showing its childlike nature. The two playfully fight, and by playfully fight, I mean that Ultraman rips the creature's f what? off. Before either party could finish the fight, the man wakes up, which resets the creature to the stone. The Triple SP asks Ultraman to return the stone to space. But before he does this, Fuji gets stopped from coming. What? This episode is definitely the most fun. The idea of a strange meteorite that telepathically shapeshifts into literally anything is such a crazy and fantastic concept that it really makes this episode stand out. It was really cool to see how children would use it, you know, for cakes and toys and stuff, and how adults would use it, you know, for a bride, liquid, a rocket, a giant monster with spinning double helixes for years. Wait, what? Oh, I should probably mention the kaiju. Gyango is a really cool design. It has this really nice, slightly techno-organic look to him, with its spinning ears and its tiny little baby robot claws. Aww. It also has this really nice splash of colors that makes it seem like something from someone's imagination, and not from nature, or for outer space for that matter. And now, for something completely different. I went out to do this episode in an accent for no damn reason. Episode 13, are you let's do this? In all seriousness, this episode shows a new side of Ide. It's his quick judgment that causes P-Star to start firing, and you can really see the emotional toll the situation has put him in. Feeling unworthy to be a Triple SP member, he tries his best to put out the fires. This is only the first of a few episodes to really give Ide a well-defined character, and one of the reasons he is my favorite member of the Triple SP. This episode is great as it marks the start of the many character-centric episodes, such as... Episode 14, The Pearl Defense Directive. Or as I like to call it, Fuji Power! A giant seal is eating Japan's supply of pearls. It's up to Fuji and her love of fine jewelry to defeat the beast. And also Ultraman. He's there too. Oh look, funny Ide stuff. So like, are Ide and Fuji, you know, touching fingers because they're... They're kind of cute. Believe it or not, this episode starring an off-brand Disney in interior crocodile alligator Chevrolet movie theater is in fact Fuji's character development episode. So kids, what do we learn? Fuji likes pearls. That's it. Go home. It's over. End the show. Also, a rocket is shoved up the giant snow no hole, and this wouldn't be the last time they do this either. Oh, I'll get to that. In almost the reverse of episode 13, both the story, character development, and effects leave much to be desired. Playing up the stereotype that all women like jewelry, Fuji's motivation seems cliche. Plus, the kaiju design is really cartoony, like it's ready to be in a bootleg of Disney's Song of the South cartoony. This episode really could have been as good as episode 13 was with defining and exploring the triple SP. However, it is just lackluster and disappointing. This isn't to say that the episode was bad. Far from it. Fuji's actress, Hiroko Sakura, has some great moments in this episode. It's just a shame that we weren't able to see everything that she could do. This episode is also notable, as this is the first appearance of Ultraman's Type B suit. Much like a flower, we start to see the Ultraman design begin to bloom. And boy, is it refreshing to see the suit looking a hell of a lot cleaner. It's really easy on the eyes now. Episode 15, Terrifying Cosmic Rays. We open on some really good illustrations of monsters. Naranga, Red King, Kanagon, Beethoven, yep, all monsters. However, one picture is mocked by the other kids. The picture of the innocent-looking Gavadon. Distraught and hurt, the kid goes off to doodle his kaiju elsewhere. However, his friends soon come and try to cheer him up. But this doesn't mean that they won't stop making fun of his doodles. After this, a mysterious Mothra noise comes from a cylinder. Soon, 
The Triple SP receives a phone call from the Tokyo University Cosmic Ray Research Center. Try saying that three times fast, because I sure as hell can't. The center detected a strange fluctuation in cosmic rays hitting the Earth, which may or may not have to do with the giant tadpole-looking kaiju in the playground. As the kids surround the beast, one kid notices that it's his drawing in the flesh. It really is Gavadon! Speaking of drawings, the one that the kid left the previous night has mysteriously vanished. Totally not Martha Larvae starts its great migration across Japan. However, the Triple SP intercept with the VTOL. Missile after missile, the creature just sits there, as though it's immune to the Triple SP's weaponry. That is until the jet blows off the creature's tail. After this attack, the creature quickly tries to escape, before sitting down to rest in front of some tanks. As the Triple SP watches it rest, they note how lazy and sleepy this kaiju is, as it doesn't care how long it sleeps. Soon, it awakens, scaring Ide. It makes its way down a street before mysteriously disappearing. A voice comes from a bright light left where the creature vanished, singing, I found the first star! Sometime after this incident, the Triple SP received a message from the French headquarters, explaining that because of the strange cosmic rays, 2D drawings become real. Back in the storage field, all of the kids are excited to help Mushiba as they redraw the kaiju and make it more colorful. As they complete the picture, they are chased off by the clearly intoxicated landowner. As soon as he leaves, the cosmic rays act again, turning now the super colorful version of Gavadon, very creatively titled Gavadon 2. The kids watch as this new creature is born from the picture. This new Gavadon is much meaner and nastier. As it roars, it begins a rampage. And by rampage, I mean, he took another nap! Back with the Triple SP, they start brainstorming for a way to finally defeat Gavadon. Ide has the idea that if the sun goes down, Gavadon will be nothing more than a picture. He says that if they find and destroy the picture, that Gavadon will be defeated. However, Arashi and Cap don't believe this theory and decide to face the creature head on, which doesn't go too well. As they attack the beast, the kids are caught in the crossfire as they beg for a stop to this. Jumping off the bridge, Hayata transforms into Ultraman. Much to the dismay of the kids, Ultraman battles Gavadon. Instead of killing the creature, Ultraman brings it to space. As the kids sit, looking up, they wonder if they will ever see their creation again. As they ponder, a voice tells them that every year, on July 7th, they will be reunited with Gavadon in the stars. So, my initial thoughts on this are, what the hell? Gavadon was not technically harming anybody, all it did was walk around and sleep. The monster started as a simple drawing from the mind of a child. It was innocent and harmless. It only reached when the Triple SP and the military started firing at it. All the kids wanted was a monster friend. There! That's it! Monster! The word of damnation. It came from the mentality of the word monster or kaiju. The Triple SP fell prey to the monster of the weak formula. They felt the need to defeat the monster because that's what they do. They see big monster, they take down big monster. But that's not always the case. The monster isn't the monster. And this shows something I wouldn't expect from early Showa Tokusatsu that our heroes were wrong. And in the context of this episode, our heroes were not heroes. Even the episode says that Cap felt darkness in his heart about what happened. All that the creature was, was an innocent creation of a child. Ide at least shared in the childlike innocence, where he and Fuji proposed a non-violent approach to defeating the creature. But instead, Cap tells them to stop theorizing and that attempting to fully kill it is the best approach. This is the fault of Cap and Arashi, who only think about violent methods to defeat the kaiju. Episode 16. Science Patrol in Space. Aiming for humanity's first exploration of Venus, astronaut Otori and his rocket are getting ready for launch. This mission from the Space Exploration Research Center involves the mission leader, Professor Mori, to launch as well. The Triple SP are on standby as there are some nasty rumors about the ignition switch for the second stage rocket, as the Triple SP set up their communications and remote piloting with the rocket. As countdown ends, both vessels take off into the atmosphere. Ide is amazed with the speed of the rocket. As they near Mach 6, the rocket successfully switches to its second stage. The Triple SP relieved that all went well, now joke about bringing Hayata down from the VTOL. Hoshino runs into the base crying. Arashi thinks that he just lost a fight and starts to give him tips, but Hoshino cuts him off, claiming that it was because their own professor's rocket lost in this race to Jupiter. I wonder if Hoshino tried to make the other rocket explode! Reporters flood into Professor Iromoto's lab, asking why he had delayed the Phoenix rocket. He claims that this is because he did not have enough time to test it. This is also explained by Cap to Hoshino, as Mori's rocket would only be 99% complete and Iwamoto wants to ensure that his is a 100% complete rocket. As the professor gives his report, oddly, not in zero Gs, Ide makes light of him eating. 
cheering everyone up with an impersonation. The feed, however, soon cuts out as a strange transmission takes its place. Ide soon recognizes that it is circuit 124875, a way for them to intercept alien languages, and that this could mean trouble. As they scramble to find what they are picking up, alien Baltan can be seen on the screen. He's back, ladies and gentlemen, and this new fleet of Baltans are attempting to invade Earth. As last time, Ultraman stopped them from setting up their barriers. The surviving Baltans were able to make a new home on planet R. However, that does not mean that they will give up their goals of inhabiting Earth. The Baltans take control of Mori's rocket and docks with his ship. Through their ability to control bodies, they trick the Triple SP into sending Hayata, Arashi, and Cap to rescue the rocket. Soon, they crash and are confronted by the Baltans. Hayata transforms into Ultraman and tries to shoot the leader with his Specium Beam. However, it is reflected, causing the Baltan to gain the upper hand. The Triple SP are alerted of a Baltan fleet that has entered the atmosphere. It is revealed that the Baltans have tricked Ultraman into traveling out into space so that they could invade. Ultraman, reasonably pissed, inserts his Game Genie and types the teleport cheat code. Now, back on Earth, Ultraman uses a combination of eye and arm beams to defeat the Baltans. With this invasion over, Professor Mori lands his rocket and saves the Triple SP. It's really great to see Baltan again, especially now that we get to see a ton more of them. The Triple SP actually plays a big part in stopping the Baltan invasion. While nothing stands out for FX work, this episode will say for a few clever tricks to give the illusion of being space, there is one standout quality of this episode. I have said this before, but what's great about Ultraman is the team. They never take a back seat. They are always on the front line. It was great to see Ide utilize his new invention, the Mars 133. Ultraman wouldn't be able to take on the multitude of Baltans himself, so it's great to see that the Triple SP have his back. This episode really is a miniature palaza with a ton of little Baltans. I kind of want one. Uh, when did Ultraman get laser eyes? Is this one? Could he teleport? Episode 22, Overthrow the Surface. We open as Anne, a member of the Paris headquarters, arrives in Japan with a special mission. What is this special mission, though? It isn't until Anne arrives at the Triple SP base and speaks to Murdermatsu that we find... What the hell? Did he just shoot her? Oh, it was just a test. Passing the test, Anne is welcomed and introduced to the members of the Triple SP. As Cap calls everyone into the room, we learn that Hayata is to be transferred to the Paris branch to help test an experimental rocket. Yeah, because that always works out for them. His friends congratulate him for this opportunity, but Hayata is reluctant. They wish him off as he and Anne take off with a VTOL. However, Arashi soon notices a strange object in the sky. Communications with the other branches of the Triple SP are cut off. No, not only communications with the branches, it seems that the world's satellites are completely scrambled. Ide and Arashi are sent out to the TV station. They are told that something, or someone, is jamming all the signals. As they walk and talk, the producer believes that the Triple SP are the cause, as the largest responses come from these locations. On their way back to base, Ide spots a woman. No, that's Anne! Wait! But didn't she and Hayata leave for Paris? Arashi shuts down Ide's theory as it couldn't possibly be her. Conducting their own tests, the two soon find out what was causing them their issues. A small device that was jamming the signals over all of Tokyo. With communication restored, they attempt to contact Hayata and discuss the possible culprit. Ide believes Anne must have planted it, but Arashi wonders if it was the doing of aliens. In an attempt to answer their questions, the team heads off to patrol space. As Ide and Arashi patrol the sky, Ide spots Anne again, exiting a car in the middle of nowhere. As the two watch, a kaiju's roar can be heard. The two agree that they must follow her in the jet VTOL, but along the way, they find Hayata's communicator. As they try and figure out what exactly happened, they get confirmation that the individual was Anne. As the two never arrived, Ide strokes his gun. Hayata, kidnapped and in a trance-like state, is told that his captors will soon bring out and brainwash Ultraman. These people of the underground will use both their monster, Telazon, and Ultraman to destroy the overworld. Breaking into the room in the nick of time, Ide fights the controlled Anne. As Telazon is sent out, the underground people attempt to control Ultraman. However, this plan comes apart as Ultraman is unable to be brainwashed, even if his host succumbs. Ultraman and the kaiju fight, and comes out as the winner. By far, this is the most different of the series. This is like the long lost son of Ultra Q. And what a fantastic episode it was. Everything about the cinematography, the chilling atmosphere, this was all Kubrick-esque. Just take a look at this scene. It's like an Ultra Q episode. It even uses the same audio cues, not to mention it borrows a lot of the same shots and cinematography. This episode shares a ton of similarities with its predecessor. Ultra Q has very strange dreamlike qualities brought upon through the excellent work of the director, Akio Jisoji. This is in part by his unique visual style, which has its roots in his horror film adaptations. This style helps this episode stand out and are some of the best out of Ultraman. For example, his next episode would be... Episode 23, My Home is Earth. It was the year the International Peace Conference was being held in Tokyo, but that year, planes and boats are mysteriously disappearing. The Triple SP are on high alert as they are briefed of where and when accidents are occurring. Ide wonders 
what country could possibly be doing this? But Alan asks the question, what if it's not of this world? Meanwhile, a single car was driving wildly on Route 1. It had just killed a senior citizen and a child in a hit and run. After a long chase, both the officer and this unknown driver crash against the wall. Wait, no, there's nothing there. The Triple SP head out to check out this invisible wall. As they approach the crash site, they hit the wall. As they are unable to move, they all quickly leave the car, right as it explodes. As the inevitable rocket takes off, it is up to Ide and Fuji to take it back down. After a long chase and some piss poor aiming from Ide, the rocket gets away. Back at HQ, the team discuss how invisibility is possible. The rocket is rotating so fast that it becomes see-through, much like a bicycle wheel or colors on a solar wheel. As Ide constructs a new device to make the ship visible, Fuji comes out and hangs with him. The next day, Cap briefs the team. With the new spectral ray guns, the Triple SP will be able to make the enemy ship visible, so they could finally deal with it. And it works. However, the being piloting the ship flees, and the Triple SP give chase, with Ide acting as though this is a fun game. This creature, who Alan calls Jamala, disappears. Night draws close as the team sets up a camp. As the team relaxes, they ask how Alan knew the creature's name. The French Triple SP's worst thoughts had come true. Jamala is no monster. He is a human. It was back during the space race. A manned satellite sent up by a certain country did not return. The astronaut's disappearance was covered up as it was discovered that this man, Jamala, had died for science. It would be catastrophic. So, Jamala's satellite wandered space and reached some planet. However, this planet didn't have water or air like Earth. So Jamala adapted to the new environment. Jamala became a kaiju. Hearing this, Ide refuses to fight. Jamala is one of them, a human. He can't fight him. Any one of them could become like Jamala someday. Ide now comes to the realization that it was because of his invention that they now have to fight Jamala. Alan, silhouetted in darkness, repeats their orders. They must kill Jamala. Hayata consoles Ide, saying that he understands how he feels. However, Jamala must be destroyed as they are now an enemy of humanity. They confront Jamala. As Jamala nears a village, a young boy and the Triple SP run against the crowds. The boy frees a pigeon as Jamala starts to burn the village. Hayata soon saves the kid. As Jamala stares at the chaos, his humanity starts to show. Having lived on a planet without water, Jamala was immune to fire. So in order to counter him as he nears the peace conference, anti-aircraft guns with artificial rain bullets were deployed. These guns start to fire, leaving Jamala in agony. Hayata transforms into Ultraman and wrestles with Jamala, holding him back from getting any closer to the building. Ultraman, with no other option, sprays down Jamala as he screams in pain. Sometime later, the Triple SP grieved Jamala. Jamala has now returned to their home, as they have now become Earth. Jamala, the soul of a warrior who died for mankind's dreams and the advancement of science, rests here, reads a plaque outside the conference building. As life continues, Ide waits and thinks, for the victims, it is always like this. His team members call out, but Ide thinks. This right here is single-handedly one of the best episodes of the whole series. From the premise, to the big reveal, to the cinematography, to the action. Everything, absolutely everything about this episode is fantastic. But why? One word. Well, technically, name. Hideaki Anno. Now, he didn't direct this episode. He was still a little boy, probably sipping on Jamba Juice or something. I don't know. What did, what did kids drink in the 60s? This episode 100% shows where Neon Genesis Evangelion gets its inspiration from. Will Don ever find the true meaning of friendship? Is Evangelion worth watching? Does a jump to the sky really turn into a rider kick? Find out after this. The answer is no. So... I want to take a break from the community questions. This is unscripted. I'm just going to read what I chose. There were many, many great responses. Um, I'm either going to... I would like to send a link to the description for this video to the Twitter thread. I actually wanted to start with a little comic that someone kept on forwarding to me. The account is at Chase Rider, and they say... Been thinking lately about what makes Ultraman stick in my heart so much. There's a lot of reasons, but this is definitely a big one. What's really cool about this reply is that they, it's a little, uh, shoot, a little comic. It's actually really well drawn with some great, like, oil-esque ink. A great art style. They also say thanks, Ultraman, for embracing things both big and small. Oh! It's my boss! Who would have thought he'd get into Ultraman? He, re Marco Sasu, uh, at Marco Sasu recently got into Ultraman, and he was talking to me about how he's, like, in the Showa stuff. 
I'll join in since I'm not the main host. Yeah, that's right. No, I'm kidding. Ultraman has these stories of intrigue with extraterrestrials that are both allies and villains, but the conflicts still feel grounded. I especially love the bonds that grow between normal people and the Ultraman. Yeah, yeah, that that was my favorite part about Ultraman sixty six. I'm gonna I'm gonna attempt to read the name here at Afik Safik one says Ultraman is something I can turn to when my life is going to shit. Lay down, open my laptop, and watch a series straight for hours, forgetting about reality. It's something comforting that I know will cheer me up in the darkest times. It's a power fantasy with magnificent kaijus and aliens. Even if a series is bad, it's something I, I can still appreciate for the small but important life lessons. My man, woman, girl, whatever you identify as, mm, 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 preach it. I love that vibe. Excellent, excellent stuff. Ah, yes, and Basil Yo, one of the co-creators slash producers of Sacred Guardian Singa, an independent tokusatsu in Singapore and a good friend of Dream Bombs, he says a quick little blurb at Basil Yo. Ultraman is a beacon of hope and the light that guides us towards goodness. What's not to love? Exactly. Exactly, Basil. Exactly. At Digital Mayhem 40, I love how, aside from a few exceptions, Ultraman has a connected universe with lots of characters that constantly return. I love how, out of nowhere, a past Ultra or villain can come back, emphasizing the scale of this universe. It's just not the same in other tokusatsu franchises. I'm actually very excited to see this pop up. I'm thinking about covering Ultraman Orb next. Oops. Teaser. But that's definitely going to be something interesting to see in future series, how they kind of honor the legacy of Showa and other seasons as well. It's really cool. and something that, yeah, you really don't see in other Tokusatsu franchises. I totally agree. At Happy Daikon writes a cute... I like to think it's a poem. It's kind of structured like a poem. I've done this when I was a kid. It's a faded memory. A red and white cap on my head when I was a kid. A fond memory. When I eat curry and stuff, silver spoons on my eyes. I love that part. But now I've forgotten all that, and I'm living each day like I'm being chased by something. The courage you gave me is 110 billion! 110 billion! The seasons that have passed were dramatic. Yeah! Honestly? I like it. That's great. I love childhood memories and all that. I would like for you to hear from Tokufan75 or at Craven Spider on Twitter. I like Ultraman because of all the cool transformation they have. Like this. Fuck! Yeah. Chip off the old block. Proud of you, kid. There we go. Episode 31. Who goes there? So we start off with reworked audio for the intro. And I really don't like it. I don't like it at all. It's weird without the man singing in the background with a low, deep, boisterous tone. Anyway, we meet a triple SP member named Goto, who served in the Bolivia branch and has now returned to Japan after many years. However, ya boy a little sus as he is doing weird goopy things. He's acting like Dwight Schrute up in here, asking about the structural integrity of the damn joint. Ide is incredibly suspicious of Goto. Look at him being sus. He messes around with some strange looking tech. Nah, no way he's the monster of the week. The team discusses what the actual hell is up with Goto, with Ide once again demonstrating why he is the best member. Plants that are totally not garbage bags painted green start popping up around the area, leading the Triple SP to investigate. Ide, Arashi, and Hayata learn that the trash ba- I mean giant plants, are carnivorous plants that can walk and suck blood like a vampire. It is called Keronia. The three also learn that it was Goto who discovered it 20 years ago, because you know, he still totally isn't the monster of the week. Meanwhile, back at base, Fuji inspects Goto's room. She discovers a Muppet of a man that is Goto. Oh my gosh, who would have guessed? Oh no. He tases her. Holy, that's a little much, don't you think? The three question Goto, leading to Hayata to find something hidden in the suitcase. What is this green sh- What? Uh, don't touch it, man, come on. Hayata sends the sample to the professor, who determines it is in fact the Caronia plant. The professor gets the Glock, to try and blow the brains off the vegetarian cookie monster. This works as well as it should have. The thing can sure run. The damn thing loves itself some human bean juice and plans to dominate mankind because what else is it gonna do? He becomes gigantic and starts wrecking the buildings nearby. Hayata is in pursuit of Caronia, ready to do, you guessed, turn into Ultraman. Wait, is Caronia making elephant noises? The rest of the Triple SP take the disguise and go guns blazing. Ultraman blows the thing to smithereens and takes care of the rest of the ships, and calls it a day. Ide does Ide things, and all loose ends are tied up. Oh look, it's the Professor. Now in this episode, 
a name is mentioned. This being the name of a man who founded the Triple SP Far East branch more than 20 years ago prior to the series. Having encountered Kaiju previously in Ultra Q, Dr. Ichino Tani created the Far East branch of the Triple SP. He was seriously injured when the Kaiju Gold King attacked the team during a mission in the Hexagonal Village. He would then retire as their leader and hand down the position to Toshi Muramatsu. Our beloved Cap! This is explored in the 1996 computer game Ultra Strategy Mobilization of the Science Patrol, which serves as a prologue on the time of the Triple SP before the events of Ultraman. Speaking of Ultraman prologues, let's briefly talk about Episode Zero. Wait, Don, there's an Episode Zero, you may be asking? Well, it's kind of an episode. Oh god! It stars as a stage show that explains the premise of the story and introduces the characters. This episode consists of the theme being played live, character intros, a cameo by Dr. Ichino Tani, as well as a human-sized kaiju in which both the Triple SP and also human-sized Ultraman defeat. These two stories act as official prologues to the series and help expand and flesh out the team's story. Unfortunately, neither of these are officially accessible to Western audiences, but still tell fun stories. Oh shoot, right, the episode. It's okay. Episode 34 is what I like to call the crack episode. It's known as a present from the sky, but it's crack. It's 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 crack. So with that being said and done, we get one thick boy today. So thick Ultraman can't swing it right around. So the cap goes, hey, remember episode 14? No, let's do the thing again. So they do the thing and the rocket goes, but well, that didn't work. So they all thought it'd be funny to turn it into a helicopter. And then it goes in the sky like a dumpy little boy. So they celebrate with a few brewskis. Then the building crashes because Arashi blew the septic tank again. Actually, no. Yeah, boy, he's back. So, Hayat can go to the roof. And oops, he forgot the bay castle. Sweden goes, dude, 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 dude. I saw the single deviant art. Let's try it out. So they stick a hose up its ass and turn it into a damn party city balloon. And then it goes bye bye. And it goes, Yahoo! But Mr. Nader is like, you ain't done, dude. Sky down is in the sky. Ha! You get it? The sky and And some jet pilots go, Ooh! And they go, and the damn thing is coming down at Mach 2. So Mach goes, Ultraman, you go, I've been had enough of this shit. And goes, Mach 3 billion. And all like, Nyaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaa
Where did you think all the kaiju ended up after every episode? It sure as hell wasn't Denny's. This episode does something that you don't see a lot of, which is making you feel sympathetic towards the kaiju. It actually popped up numerous times throughout the show, if you've noticed. Here, let's look at some examples. First is Pigmon, and how his death is always sad and gut-wrenching. And yes, I'm still hung up about it. Second is the Baltan race. All two billion of them needed a place to live since their home was destroyed. Lastly is Jamila, a human who went to space and became monstrous and wild. Now he is forced to be terminated by his own kind. None of them, especially Ide, wanted to kill him in any way, shape, or form. He was practically torn up about it. Now, let us look at this episode. They make you sympathetic to the kaiju not only for this episode, but others from the past. The fact that they hold a Buddhist-style funeral and treat them as they are citizens of Earth speaks volume about what Ultraman is as a show. It is not a show about trying to destroy the foreign invader. It is a show that is about challenging what truly is a monster. Here, take a look at the monster of the week. His name is Sibozu. His nickname is Ghost Monster. And surely, he is a mean bony machine, right? Actually, no. He's an agitated little Shinji looking ass. He is constantly screaming in agony and just wants to go home. Instead of destroying the creature, the team decides to try and send it home. They let it live peacefully and that's what I think is truly great about this episode. Episode 37, The Little Hero. We open on a crowd who very quickly run out of a store. As we track through the crowd, we find horrified onlookers staring at some hideous creature. Wait, no! It's not ugly, it's Pigmon! The little guy is back and is now going toy shopping. Hey, are those... Are those Ultraman toys in the background? Oh, jeez. Pigmon looks around the shop and finds a Pigmon toy. His mind is blown. Unfortunately, the manager really wants him out, as he just doesn't have anything to sell him. The Triple SP are soon called, and as Pigmon takes a little nap, the team arrives. They are delighted to see their friend again, and he is too. However, it seems like Pigmon has something important to tell his friends. As Pigmon takes another nap, the Triple SP and the Dolphin Professor, Mr. Gonda, confirm that he is speaking a language. The professor takes it upon himself to try and figure this language out, as Ide builds a translator. Speaking of Ide, he seems to be down in the dump. Ide explains to Hayata that he doesn't feel the need to invent because of Ultraman. He says that it is always Ultraman who fights and defeats the kaiju, and that his weapons never work. Hayata explains to him that his weapons do work, and that they have killed monsters with them that Ultraman could not. This falls on deaf ears, as Ide continues to stay distraught. That morning, Professor Gonda arrives at the Triple SP headquarters as the language has been figured out. Now, all Pigmon has to do is talk into the translator. Pigmon tells him that the monsters that the Triple SP and Ultraman have defeated are being resurrected by the monster Geronimon. Geronimon is reviving the Triple SP's foes so that all these creatures could lead an assault and defeat the team once and for all. Geronimon's plans will fall apart as it did not know that Pigmon is the Triple SP's little hero. With hours before the attack, the Triple SP, with the help of Pigmon, travel to confront Geronimon. The Triple SP land and split up, with Hayata and Ide having to fight Dorako, while Ar Arashi, Fuji, and Cap will take on Telestan. As Cap's team succeeds with defeating their target, Hayata is having some issues with Ide. Ide has given up screaming for Ultraman to show up and defeat the beast. This alerts Dorako, who almost kills the two. However, before Dorako could make the two into a triple SP pancake, Pigmon arrives and distracts the beast, ultimately getting smushed. No! Hayata, now upset with the loss of Pigmon, confronts Ide, asking if he is ashamed as a triple SP member that their friend sacrificed himself. Again. For them. Ide comes to his senses and unveils the Spark 8, an attachment to his pistol that literally takes a whole dang chunk out of Dorako, vaporizing him. This alerts Geronimon, forcing Hayata to transform into Ultraman to fight the giant Fiesta Godzilla. After a long, amazing battle, Ultraman lifts up the kaiju in order for Ide to finish it off. Ide, now back to the old self that we all love, exclaims that he will stop relying on others and will fight for the peace of humanity. The Triple SP surrounds their friend and exclaims that for his sacrifice, Pigmon is now an honorable member of the Triple SP. With a call of silence, they mourn their fallen Conrad. Okay, so let's get something straight. This episode, King Shrek! This literally challenges the idea of the titular hero coming in to save the day every damn time. Yeah, it shows the consequences of Hayata always using Ultraman, how it affects the morale of one of the best members, Ide. Because they, and we, as an audience, got so used to Ultraman always coming back to pick up the slack, it makes you think, what is the point of all these weapons if all they need is Ultraman? Ide thinks the same. That is until Hayata quite literally slaps some sense into Ide. And boy, does Ide kick some major butt! 
Not only does this episode show that the team doesn't necessarily need to rely on Ultraman all the time, but how useful the Triple SP is to Japan. Seeing Ide charge into battle after getting his confidence back really makes the blood boil. But damn it, son of a bitch, they did it again. They killed my precious boy mercilessly. You can't keep doing this to me, Super Act. Come on, my heart. Ah! And that's it, folks. That's History of Ultraman. You ask yourself, wait, Don, what about the rest of the episodes? Okay, a lot of people might hate me for this, but I don't want to tell you guys how the show ends. Let me be clear. I want you guys to be able to experience the show for yourselves because there are some fantastic episodes like Passport to Infinity. Holy sh... History of on Dream Bomb is not meant to be an alternative to watching the show. It is meant to make you watch the original show. Please, I beg you, watch this show. It will not disappoint you. The final stretch of episodes are absolutely fantastic, and me just simply talking about them in front of my microphone in the middle of my couch while Furbus is hovering over me like a damn pigeon will not do the episodes justice. You have to go see them for yourself, as a simple matter of fact. But enough of that. Let's hear from a couple guests. The original Ultraman is like watching a bite-sized Godzilla movie 39 times in a row and it truly kickstarted its monumental franchise that has remained traditional in its style of effects and plot formulas. The original series showcased how seamlessly blended together giant monster action and lovable human characters could be, and it makes the audience connect with its titular giant hero in a very great way, something that had never really been attempted before. While it is certainly outclassed by later entries in the series, the original will always be remembered as a game changer for the kaiju genre, and it deserves to be respected and remembered as such. So. Let's look at what we have before us. We have a show that, at times, can look a little janky and reuses a lot of Toho assets. However, with that set aside, what do we actually have? We have a show where we get amazing stories, great effects, and amazing designs and miniatures. This show, believe it or not, was cutting edge. Yeah, you heard me. This show from the mid-60s is cutting edge. Without this show, we wouldn't have modern-day tokusatsu as we know it. You have to think of it like this. At the time, the only time we got effects and cinematography like this on the was on the big screen. It wasn't until Eiji Tsuburaya used his knowledge of special effects and gave us what is essentially small, weekly, cinema-quality, Showa-era monster films as a whole god dang series! At the start of the show, it was rough around the edges, but you may have heard me compare it to a flower earlier. That's because it's how I was viewing it. It's like a flower that starts out as a small little bud. Over time, you give it water, or in this case, a budget, which allows it to bloom or improve. And you get something really beautiful. The flower in full bloom. Now let's say this show isn't for you. Well, there's more than just roses when it comes to picking flowers. There's a whole damn garden. You got petunias, rhododendrons, foxgloves, tulips, lilacs, the list goes on and on and on. You don't have to like the show by any means. You do you. But at the very least, you have to respect what it did for modern tokusatsu and the groundwork it laid out for numerous Ultraman series. Hell, not even that. Just look at how cemented it is as an icon of pop culture of not only Japan, but the world over. The people it has inspired like Guillermo del Toro and Hideaki Anno. And without Ultraman, we wouldn't have such great works like Pacific Rim or Neon Genesis Evangelion. Oh, and I guess Will Smith and NSYNC like it as well? As you can see, Ultraman has become more than a show and has bloomed into an icon. It takes me back to when I was in programming class. Everyone decided to debate who would win in a fight against Goku. The usual suspects started popping up like Superman, Ben 10, Batman. I decided to be a little sneak and say Ultraman. That's when my professor walked in and said, Ah, uh, so you mean the entirety of Japan? I never thought much about it until I decided to cover Ultraman for History Of. Ultraman is an icon. He is cemented into the minds of people everywhere and has inspired so many, countless upon countless people. When you think Ultraman, you think of Japan as much as you think of giant robots or people in spandex doing outlandish poses or, of course, karate bugmen. When it comes to Ultraman, that silver red giant is in a league of his own. I'm Dawnbreaker, and that's all for today. Special thanks to Furbus and Marcos, and thanks Mill Creek for this badass Blu-ray. Breaker, Dawn Breaker, Dawn Breaker's epic video time. Dawn Breaker. In the city of Dawn Breakerville. 
the city is completely peaceful until the day that the not the peace unpeaceful thing happened. Hey guys, my name is Dawnbreaker and welcome to History of ah! Where am I? Dawnbreaker, it's okay. You you're dead. D dead? How c how could I be dead? Oh, wait, shut up. <laughs> Matthew Broderick is in the city, and he's destroying everything. So y you want me to stop Matthew Broderick? Listen, kid. Take these swag glasses. They're going to help you on your mission. Uh, so do I just pr press this? <laughs> Matthew Broderick! Matthew Broderick! No, Matthew Broderick! No, stop! Stop, Matthew! I'm here to stop you, Matthew Broderick! You can't stop me, Dawnbreaker! You see, I am powerful! Powerful enough to star in the hit 80s classic teen movie, Ferris Bueller's Day That's Off! That's it, Matthew Broderick! You're going down! It's time to perform my finisher! The Dawn Breaker! Thank you, Matthew Broderick for 1998 Godzilla. <laughs> Oh man, I did it. History of Ultraman is finally done. Yay! Time for some. Yeah, what, do you, what do you mean? What do you mean done? What? Yeah, no time for anything. Get, oh get to God. the last three episodes. What are you? What are you doing? Dustin Beetle, what are you doing here? I, I, I'm obviously doing what every Tokusatsu fan does and sits here and watches one of Marcos's history of videos so then they can say they actually watch the show without actually watching the show. Now tell me the end of Ultraman so I can be cool with all the Ultraman kids. Like your mom and corkscrews are all around. <laughs> this is a PG channel, please. <laughs> hey, shut the shut fuck up! But shut up! Talking yeah. about the ending. Uh, let's talk about the ending. Just... Okay, you know what? You know what? What? Shut I'm, I'm going to go back. And go watch Linkara's History of Power Rangers because at least those are consistent and tell me the ending. Oh. I can wait another four or eight years. When was the last one released, huh? October. Wow!